Welcome to Bible study. I wish you could be here in person. We meet here at the church in Madaryville every Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, this study will conclude the Gospel of Luke, a book written by a godly Gentile medical doctor named Luke. Uh, he had been a companion at times of the Apostle Paul and is the only Gentile writer of Scripture, uh, giving us the Gospel of Luke and then the sequel to the Gospel of Luke, the book of Acts. If the Lord continues to lead us, I believe that he is, we'll be moving right into the sequel, right into the book of Acts next week. Well, according to the book of Acts, the gospel of Luke is what Jesus began to do and teach. We see this in Acts 1. And then Acts will be what he continues to do and teach through his Holy Spirit anointed church. Uh, what Jesus did, he taught, he uh, healed the sick, he raised the dead. What did he teach well his his words and these are things that we still do as a church we do and we teach both by the power of the Holy Spirit and that's where Acts comes in well the final chapter here takes us from the empty tomb the Lord's resurrection to the day he ascended back to heaven we serve a risen Savior he's no longer the baby lying in Bethlehem's manger the babe we saw in Luke 2 He's no longer the suffering Savior hanging on Calvary's cross that we saw in Luke 23. Today, he is the resurrected, ascended Savior who sits at the Father's right hand. He's the baptizer in the Holy Ghost, and he is our soon coming King. Hallelujah. Well, with that being said, let's get right into the precious Word of God, beginning with Luke 24.1. In fact, before we even get into that, let's back up just a little bit and read the final verses of the previous chapter because they are so important to our understanding of what happens here. Luke 23:55, And the women also which came with him from Galilee followed after and beheld the sepulcher and how his body was laid, and they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath day according to to the commandment, which takes us up to verse 1 of the next chapter, chapter 24. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. Praise God. Jesus had been three days in the tomb. His body had been. Roman soldiers had carefully guarded the tomb. It had been sealed. And we read this from the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew 27, 62. Now the next day that followed, the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that this deceiver, or that deceiver, said while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulchre be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, so the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, You have a watch, go your way, and make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. Now, a watch of Roman soldiers consisted of a group of four soldiers who changed shifts every four hours. And uh, so the penalty for losing whatever it was, whoever it was that they were guarding, was death. Very serious. Now, because of the upcoming Sabbath, the women had not completed their preparation of Jesus' body. So they came early on Sunday morning to finish, still grieving horribly, I'm sure. And Jesus had made it clear that he would rise again, but that doesn't seem to be a hope that anyone has at this time. You know, they still don't seem to have gotten what Jesus said. But that tomb was, was guarded, it was sealed, a heavy stone blocked its entrance. And when the women returned to the tomb, they found the stone rolled away and the tomb empty. Now, you might ask, what happened to those soldiers? What happened to that watch? Where are they? Well, we read in Matthew 28 that they passed out. 
for fear. They fell on their faces. They, they passed out and lay there as dead men because of fear. And then we have another question. Did Jesus even need the stone to be rolled away to get out of the tomb? And of course, the answer is no. We find later that in his resurrected body, he was not limited by those things. He entered a room that Sunday evening, a locked room without coming through the door. But an angel rolled that stone away, not because it was needed for Jesus to escape the tomb, but it was for the benefit of those who would come and see. Praise the Lord, the tomb is empty. And now for the second time, uh, in the book of Luke, we find the angels bringing an announcement of glorious good news. The first time, it was that Jesus had been born, Luke 2.10. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, and this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And then the next time uh, the angels uh, appeared here to bring the good news that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. Praise God. See this in Luke 24. It came to pass as they were much perplexed thereabout. Behold, two men, notice it calls them men. Two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. What was their first response to the empty tomb? Well, the Bible says here they were perplexed. A word that means baffled, mystified, or even confused. This was certainly not what they were expecting. And I want you to also notice that it speaks of these angels as two men. Luke calls them men here. We know they were angels. So why does Luke call them men? Well, angels are spirit beings, not normally bodily beings. And we know from the Bible a spirit does not have a body as we know it. However, God does allow angels to appear in bodily form here on earth. And when they do, it's generally in human form. So seeing these angels, they went from being perplexed to being afraid. And Can you blame them? The angel says, don't you remember what Jesus told you back in Galilee? He would rise on the third day. If you'd like the exact reference for that statement in Galilee, it's Luke 18, 31 through 34. Uh, he told them these things, and it says in verse 34, they understood none of these things, and this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. So I think some of these things are still hidden from their minds and hearts. Now there are several ways that unbelieving skeptics try to explain away the glorious truth of the resurrection. But it's just like we'll later read in Acts 1, he showed himself alive by many infallible proofs. Uh, the Enduring Word Commentary speaks of some of the things the skeptics say. Uh, some of the, the ways they try to explain away the resurrection of Christ. Perhaps you have or will have heard or will hear some of these things. Some say the women simply went to the wrong tomb. You know, after all, they were grieving, they were confused, etc., but don't you remember from the previous chapter, Luke 23, 55, uh, they followed after as Jesus was buried. They beheld the sepulcher. They very well knew where it was. Others say that it was just a question of wishful thinking. Uh, they wished so hard that Jesus would rise that they made themselves believe that it happened. Impossible for a number of reasons, but just see how surprised and perplexed they were. This was nothing that they expected. Here's a horrible one. There are even those who claim that animals ate his body. However, that does not take into consideration the stone and the, and the seal and the Roman guard. 
or that Jesus didn't really die. He merely swooned and the, the cool of the tomb revived him and he left of his own accord. Don't they consider all that he'd been through? The fact that he had endured a, a Roman scourging, had that great blood loss that he was tightly wound in linen and the stone was so huge that it was guarded, it was sealed. There's no way that could have happened. Or perhaps the most unbelievable is this, the disciples stole his body. Once again, that's answered by the presence of the Roman guard, the seal. Also, now think about this. If the disciples stole his body and maintained that secret, that hoax, it's so strange that they were all willing to give their lives. All of them except John died as martyrs for something they knew was a fake, a hoax. Impossible. There's only one logical explanation. It is just as the word of God tells us. He rose again by the power of God and the tomb is now empty. Hallelujah. Well, those women became the first evangelists. It says in verse 8, and they remembered his words. You know, those words that had been hidden up to this time became real to them. And they returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James and other women that were with him, which told these things unto the apostles. And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Then arose Peter and ran unto the sepulcher, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. So the word became real to them at that moment. They remembered the word. The word was revealed to them. And we see that several times in this chapter. We know that this is the work of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you remember the promise of Jesus in John 14, 26. That he said, the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. And bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Then when the word becomes real to us by the power of the Spirit, we want to tell somebody about it. And that's what they did. They had to tell somebody. They were eyewitnesses of the resurrection. They had to tell what they'd seen, what they'd experienced. In this case, not seen the body of Jesus. So they were the first evangelists, bearers of the good news. But their congregation, those that they shared with, did not yet believe. Their words, their quote-unquote preaching seemed like idle tales to them. Idle tales. What, what does that mean? One translation says their words seem like nonsense, or another says fairy tales. How many times have you been there? You know, we've shared something precious with another person only to have them discount it, or to roll their eyes, or to make light of it. Now, here's something else. We, we may not think of that in this day and time, but... It's an amazing thing that the first witnesses of the resurrection were women. Because what do you know about the testimony of women in those days? Well, the testimony of women was not acceptable in a Jewish court of law. Uh, Josephus, that ancient Roman or Jewish historian, said that even the testimony of multiple women was not acceptable because of what he said, the levity and boldness of their sex. A man named Celsus, an early critic of Christianity, Discounted the testimony of Mary Magdalene, calling her a hysterical female. But it was through the testimony of these women that Peter and the others ultimately went to see for themselves, and they found things just as the women had told them. Now, I want you to know something. If people had just, quote, unquote, made up the word of God, as some suggest, they would have never in that culture written up the women as the eyewitnesses. They're the ones God chose, and that's another mark of the Bible's authenticity. Praise God for the testimony of these godly women. Well, next we see Jesus appearing to two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Verse 13, And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. 
but their eyes were holden that they should not know him. So they are on their way from Jerusalem to Emmaus, a distance of about seven miles, 60 furlongs, here in the King James Version. And as they walked together, they did what most of us do when we're walking together with someone else. We converse. They were talking about what had just taken place in Jerusalem, the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I can imagine that this was a very somber walk, a very somber conversation. It says that they reasoned. They, they were trying to sort things out. And I don't really know about you, but sometimes that's what I do when I need to sort things out. I go take a walk. But as they walked, the Lord appeared there on the road with them. But they didn't recognize who he was. Now, there's all kind of speculation as to why they didn't recognize him. But anything we can say here is just speculation. The Lord doesn't tell us. But I do love what Charles Spurgeon says about this. He said, when two saints are talking together, Jesus is very likely to come and make the third one in the company. He did that on this day, didn't he? Talk of him and you will soon talk with him. I think that's wonderful. It's wonderful to think that when we're talking about Jesus, he'll make his presence known. That's a good reason to talk about Jesus. In fact, I know that he's right here with us as we study his word together. How precious and wonderful is that? Now, as Jesus appeared, he asked what they were talking about. Of course he knew, but he wanted them to tell him, you know, what are you talking about? Verse 17, and he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? And he, he saw they were very somber, they were very sad, perhaps there were tears in their eyes. And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And, they, and when they found not his body, they came saying that, they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. Now one of the two, Cleopas, he said, you know, we're so surprised that, you know, you haven't heard about all of this. You must be a stranger. You must be new in town. This is the talk of the town. He said, we're talking about Jesus of Nazareth. He was a mighty prophet. He was mighty in word and deed. Remember what I said about Acts and Luke, what Jesus said and what he did. They said our own rulers, our own chief priests delivered him to be killed. They crucified him. I want you to note verse 21. It says, but we trusted. You know, they, uh, they believed that he was going to be the one that would redeem Israel. Past tense. And they're not so sure about that now. Another reason for their sadness. They said that was three days ago, and now some of the women say the body's gone. Some of our number went to the tomb, and it was empty. They'd heard all the testimony, but doesn't yet seem to really register with them in their hearts and souls. And then Jesus takes them to the word. He opens the scriptures to them in verse 25. Then he said to them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He said, your unbelief is foolishness. The word of God has already made it clear that the Messiah will suffer and die before being glorified. So the Lord gives them a refresher course of the Old Testament scriptures, beginning with the Torah, the Pentateuch, the, the five books of Moses, and then taking them through the prophetic books, all the many prophecies that point directly to the Lord Jesus Christ. How many times Jesus may have expounded on the scriptures to these disciples in the past, but still they didn't get it. And still they don't get who's speaking to them now. But I believe the Lord gives us a wonderful example here when we're perplexed, when we need answers. 
when we're grieving, we must turn to the word. That's where we'll find the answers that we need. And it was then and there that Jesus revealed to them in an amazing way, through all of all things, the breaking of bread, who he truly was. He revealed himself through the breaking of bread. Verse 28. And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went, and made as though he would have gone, and he made it as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them, and it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and brake and gave to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said, One to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? So at first they didn't know the identity of this wonderful stranger that walked with them, but they did know they didn't want him to leave. They asked him to stay. It's getting late. So the Lord sat down with them to an evening meal. Some have asked, will we eat in heaven? Well, Jesus did in his glorified body. I have no reason to believe that we'll not do so. Perhaps not having to eat in order to live, but certainly we'll eat. There is going to be a marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven. What Jesus did here in breaking the bread, blessing the bread, is very much like what he did at the Last Supper. But through the breaking of bread, their eyes were opened. Some believe that as he broke the bread, they were able to see the nail scars in his hands. Quite possible. Perhaps they all of a sudden realized that they'd heard those words of blessing before. Whatever the case, the Holy Spirit opened their eyes to his identity. The Spirit of God will always lift up and reveal Jesus. Hallelujah. Now they have a new conversation. Did not our hearts burn within us as he shared with us the scriptures? And the next leg of their trip had a very, very different atmosphere. Jesus changes everything. And just as the first eyewitnesses, the women at the tomb, had done, they had to tell somebody. They shared their testimony with the disciples back in Jerusalem. You know, he is risen indeed. Verse 33 says they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together. And them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way, and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. You know, you have an encounter with Jesus, you just want to tell somebody. Telling somebody is a part of what really, quote-unquote, seals our salvation experience. Romans 10 says that we believe in our hearts and we confess with our mouth. Romans 10.9 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So these two believed in their hearts and now they're confessing with their mouths. The Lord is risen indeed. He appeared to Simon Peter. Now he appeared to us through the breaking of bread. Praise God. If you had an experience with Jesus Christ, you need to tell somebody about it. And then right at that glorious moment, Jesus himself appears Right in their midst. Verse 36. And as they thus spake. Jesus himself stood in the midst of them. And saith unto them. Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted. And supposed that they had seen a spirit. Or we might say a ghost. And he said unto them. Why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet. That it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. Here we find the definition of a spirit, a, a being without flesh and bones. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have you any meat? And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and of a honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before them. So they'd heard these words of peace or shalom before. They, they heard them for one while on a storm on the Sea of Galilee or when, on board a ship on the Sea of Galilee during a storm. And the Lord spoke to the wind and the waves saying, peace be still. Shalom, be still. Now he's speaking that same peace. Not to a physical storm, but to the storm of anxiety and fear and unbelief that's raging in their hearts. Oh my, how things change when Jesus comes into the room. Hallelujah. He still bears in his body the scars, those identifying features. 
This was indeed the same Jesus that had walked with them for three and a half years, the same Jesus they'd seen crucified and buried. Now, there are those who do not believe that Jesus rose bodily. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, uh, believe that Jesus just disappeared or rotted away or turned to dust, that only his spirit rose. Now, that's certainly not what the resurrected Lord himself taught here. He made it clear that he was risen bodily. He was not a spirit. You know, after all, they could touch him. They could see the scars. He could eat with them. It's very, very important that we believe in his resurrection, but even more specifically, his bodily resurrection. It's an integral part of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then I love this next part. Just as he did with these two on the road to Emmaus, Jesus opened up the word of God to all of them there in the room. He opened their understanding of the scriptures. Verse 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. So everything you're seeing, everything you're experiencing today, he says, is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. You might remember that he spoke to the two on the road to Emmaus of the scriptures from Moses, that's the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, and the prophets. This time he adds the Psalms, which also have many messianic prophecies. But I'm so glad that we have the scriptures and that the Lord can give us understanding of them. Now, that does not mean perhaps perfect understanding of every detail, but don't let the devil tell you that you can't understand the Bible. Instead, ask the Lord to open your understanding to the scriptures, and I believe he'll still do so. And this, of course, still is the work of the Holy Spirit. He said, you're to be witnesses of these things. Uh, beginning here at Jerusalem, you're to tell far and near, ultimately, to the uttermost parts of the earth uh, that there is a risen Savior that can save the souls of mankind. And we're still fulfilling that divine mandate. Uh, we are witnesses of those very same things. He's made himself real to us as well. And we see here that Jesus gave them a command, a commission, a divine mandate, but he also promised the power to fulfill that mandate. He said, tarry until you receive the power to fulfill my command. Tarry until you're endued with power from on high. Verse 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Uh, we find later that the word tarry means to wait with anticipation. And 120 of them would take heed to his command and wait expectantly in Jerusalem until. Like I said, they weren't told to, how long to wait, just to wait until. Now, you might ask, do we receive all that there is at the moment of conversion? I believe these individuals were already saved in the upper room. Uh, the day Jesus rose from the dead, he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And I believe that they did. And I believe at that time that they were indwelt by the Holy Spirit as all born-again believers are. And he comes to dwell within. However, that was not the empowering that he speaks of here. What he speaks of here is what we call the baptism in the Holy Spirit, as prophesied by John the Baptist. Uh, John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water under repentance, but there's one coming after me who is mightier than I. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Now, just as all believers are to carry the gospel, it is God's will that all believers be empowered by the Holy Spirit to finish that task. Not working in the arm of flesh, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. I, I think of the words of Zechariah. It's not by might nor by power, God says, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Now, this... Coming up next is the pivotal point where Luke uh, melds with its sequel, the, the book of Acts. Luke ends with Jesus giving the commission and the promise of power and then ascending to heaven. 
Acts begins with the same. So in verse 50, it says, And as he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them, and it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven, and they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. Hallelujah. This is the end of 40 days. The 40 days in which he appeared alive by infallible proofs after his resurrection. He showed himself alive to many. On one occasion we read about in 1 Corinthians, he appeared alive to about 500 people at one time. But now he's going to go back to the Father. But he'd already told them before. We see this in John 15. It's a good thing that I go back to the Father. He said it's expedient for you. John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. It says it's a good thing that I go back to heaven because then I'll send the Comforter. Now, we don't know just how many disciples were there as he ascended back to heaven, but he blessed them all. And because he's now our great high priest, it wouldn't surprise me a bit. If he didn't bless them with the priestly blessing found in number 622. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Whatever the case is, he was blessing them with uplifted hands. He was caught up to heaven. Acts as a cloud received him out of their sight. They worshiped. And at least 120 of them were obedient to him, returning to Jerusalem to wait expectantly for what he had promised. This takes us right up. If Jesus tarries, we'll be getting into the book of Acts, and that's where we find them. They're at the beginning of Acts. Praise God. Well, he lives. He lives. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Hope you can say the same thing. If you cannot, today is a day to do something about that. Pray along with me today as we pray and ask the Lord to save your soul. He'll do just that, just as he's promised, if you'll ask him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the glorious good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he is our king, our Lord, our master, that he is seated at the Father's right hand, that one day he will return to this earth to judge the living and the dead. Lord, we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he is risen from the dead. We ask you, our risen Savior, to save us, to forgive us. Write our names down in the book of life. And make us new creatures as you've promised in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God forever. Well, until we meet again, may our Lord hold you in the hollow of his hand. And don't forget, the same Jesus that died, rose again, and ascended back to heaven. Sent the Holy Spirit. Next great event as he is coming again, Maranatha.